All right, hello world. This is CS50 on Twitch. My name is Colton Ogden, and I'm joined today by Nick Wong. What? Been a while. It's been yeah. a few weeks. Have you been? Yeah. Wow. Um, so to be honest, terrible. Yeah. I've been, been talking about this terrible. for the stream. Been a little sick. Yeah. A uh, little bit. I think last year I spent most of my, or last year, wow, <laughs> still recovering. Uh, last week I spent most of the week at around 103, 104 degrees. Ooh. Apparently 100 and 506 is dangerous, so I was, I was just like, a little Basically off. you're like on fire cooking yeah. at that point. Yeah, I kind of so. wish my grades looked like that. Like I wish I just <laughs> kept them at around 104 and then my temperature at where my grades are. Um, <laughs> actually, no, that... I would, I would die. Uh, <laughs> I wish my temperature was normal, so. Yeah, yeah 98. <laughs> have a good old 98.6. I'll take that as a grade. I'll That'd be a pretty awesome grade. Actually, I'd be okay with that, too. Yeah, <laughs> if that was my grade, I'd be chilling. Last time we were here, um, we were going to talk about cryptocurrency, but unfortunately, yes. we had some issues. So apologies yeah. to everybody who tuned in this time or who watched the last stream. Um, but today, it seems like everything's good. People described the audio last time as crispy. Yeah, that, which is not how I wanted to be described. No. It, it did, in fact, sound like some things were catching fire. Like just burning down. Uh, yeah, so hopefully we're not blowing everyone's eardrums out. Hopefully it's not crispy at all. Yeah, definitely um, everybody let us know. We have a ton <laughs> of people in the chat. Know. Some amazingly hilarious comments that we were reading yeah. before we actually started. Yeah, um, a shout out to everyone. Lince, Bella, uh, Akil Tipu, Sefeba. Um, Sal58-2019, bonjour, hello from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Wow, That's so, awesome, hello. That's cool. Thank you for joining us today. Andre, yeah. remote, EO7, Sham, <laughs> Yin Yang. Um, Bora Maps and um, some other folks here. We somebody asked, "Where is our Overlord Colton?" <laughs> Which we were laughing at right here in the flesh. Um, in Bad Ignite, Warbird Games. Hi Colton, love CS50 as well as your GD course. Love having these live streams. Thanks for all the fun and inspiration. Awesome. Thank nice you so job. much, Warbird, for uh, tuning in. Your voices are lovely. Says a killer potato and chat cool. says a killer potato Sweet. for Not joining us anymore. again. That's good. So I'm saying hello, Nick. Welcome hello. back. Folks are excited to see you again. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate um, that. I'm glad that you are well enough to give this talk today. Yeah, me too. We didn't catch you on the cusp of your 100 <laughs> yeah. degree fever because that would have been oh, terrible. Oh, that would have been much worse. I would have been less lucid um, and or coherent. And uh, M. Kloppenberg as well. Oh, uh, oh so maybe oh. you don't have to close the tag. Sorry, we were before the stream, we were testing to kind of see how you can censor things um, yeah. in, in the public chat versus like what we can see. And M. Kloppenberg has... In, in like kind of hidden these things um, with not closing the tag. Maybe we're just stupid. You know, like we, we just thought like, oh, you have to close the tag. We thought we we did science and we established that our hypothesis, yeah. that Nick's hypothesis, the, we was right. true. <laughs> um, turns out that we have data that uh, <laughs> disputes this. Not true. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe. Maybe it's just magic. Adam, hey Colton, the Pokemon game in the GD course is incredible. Nice, awesome, you're making Very really nice. good progress. That's like one of the last oh. presets in the games course. Yeah, wow, actually it is. Wow, that's, dang, that's you guys crazy. are getting there, right? And it's, Muhammad uh, says hello from Pakistan. <laughs> oh, how's the internship going uh, at uh, Google? Yes, um, so currently not going. Uh, I, it'll actually start this summer, so I am currently just a full-time student and trying to survive my classes. Um, shout out to every one of my professors making things as hard as possible. Um, oh no, there goes my laptop. But yeah, I will start over there this summer, um, which, is, which is a fun time. I'm very excited about that, actually. Uh, especially because work is just so much more peaceful than school. You know, like <laughs> you, you can eat and um, sleep and you're not stressed, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Whereas when you're in school, if you're eating or sleeping, you could be studying, and that's, uh, yeah. uh, that's a rough time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I feel like that's uh, I feel like the environment's definitely very different. Shout out yeah. to also thanks to all the to the followers: Colin Porras, Bot Jeffs, Ig Riley, Warbird Games, <laughs> yeah, Saucy welcome. Flack. Thank you <laughs> Saucy all very much. Flack. Internet Google. Day. Sometimes these names. <laughs> um, what do you think of Code Academy awesome. for web programming? I think they're a really good start. You know, like you go in Code Academy, you kind of get some basics of syntax and things. I think there's a lot of online stuff that's really useful for getting familiar with syntax. I'm a huge fan personally of just kind of going and um, exploring as many things as you can. So if you happen to start on Code Academy or you look at W3 schools or you're on Free Code Academy, things like that, I think anything that you're getting exposure to stuff is, I think, really useful. Um, because I think. A lot of CS is just seeing terminology, uh, kind of knowing that things exist so that you can go Google them, basically. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that a lot of times, if you're just getting exposed to syntax, or you're getting exposed to concepts, um, that is a big part of it. That's a big part of the puzzle. And the other part of it is the educational part, sure. so whether it's self-taught or through school. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, I definitely think people, a lot of the time, are looking for this sort of, um, I don't know, magical 
sort of fountain of youth in terms of coding, and yeah, it's you know it's, it's kind of just, a, you've got to get in there and just do stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, just exactly. get exposure, and you'll <laughs> fill in all the blanks, and you'll get all of the bits and pieces that aren't maybe perfect, sort yeah, of ironed exactly. out as you see more and more data, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then Beer Seeker, the original, awesome name, asks, uh, what about Udemy? Are you familiar with Udemy? Oh, I actually, I really like Udemy. Um, I recently used a Udemy course for learning, um, what was I learning? Oh, Swift. I was, I was kind of like working on my iOS dev skills and kind of the workflow for that. And I looked at the Udemy course from London App Brewery, I think. Um, and there's, there's a woman who teaches that who is just like ridiculously overqualified. She's like a doctor and then became a coder and teaches these courses. Um, she's super cool. She's hilariously funny, very interesting. Shout out to that. I can't remember her name. I'm is it so Angela sorry. Yu? Yes, Angela okay. Yu, thank you. Because uh, I have awesome. her Swift course as well. But I, haven't so taken, cool. I have not done a single minute of that course, but I oh, have it's great. knowing it's great that I might want to in the future. <laughs> yeah, I very much admire and respect her and what she's done. She's done great cool. reviews on, yeah. the, on the videos that I've seen. Yeah, she's um, awesome. <laughs> I did Code Academy for learning Python, first time programming, and it really helped. Oh, that's awesome. Um, Struggling to learn Node in a workflow and tasks <laughs> aspect. Yeah, um, um, well, so Node.js is basically just for uh, applying JavaScript in a kind of your computer's environment rather than a browser. But um, I think that a lot of times the like workflow behind any sort of like full stack of JavaScript is Kind of dependent on where you're working. I know that at like Facebook, uh, you're using like React as a front end, and then you might use Node in the back. Um, but at like Google, we're using Angular, I believe. Um, and so it's a lot of just like kind of depends on what your use case is, really. I think. Um, but I also think that if you're learning a workflow, um, that's not going to hurt you. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think you're ever hurting yourself by going out and learning something new. Um, it, there's a lot of people that focus on like the right or the wrong way to do things, um, and there certainly are things that have better uh, have advantages or disadvantages for what you're trying to do. But a lot of things can be solved um, or adapted, basically, um, depending on the problem you're trying to solve. So I think learning the more you learn, the better you're able to kind of just pick a tool from your tool chest um, and throw it out there. Yeah. Makes yeah. sense. Um, to Pika Mika 2's point, summary for today's class, please, and then we maybe use that yeah. as a segue to getting into uh, what we're, we're talking talk. about. Cool. So today we're going to talk about cryptocurrency um, and blockchain. Take two. Yeah, take two. <laughs> we're going to actually talk about it a little bit this time. Um, which cryptocurrency, blockchain, Bitcoin, um, there's a lot of these buzzwords out there. Um, I think we're a little bit behind actually on the. Um, Catching onto that like fashionable wave of Bitcoin and it going up to like twenty grand a coin and things like that, um, but I think that this is a good time to actually sit down and chat about it because there's a lot of people who are like, well, it's a fad, it's um, kind of going away, it'll disappear. Um, there are a lot of people who are still obsessed with it in kind of a way that I think is a little unhealthy, where they're <laughs> like, that is the entire future. Um, and I think that of course there is some nuance about that. Um, and actually, Code Blood. Uh, Drex, Code Blooded Rex, there we go. And man, I'm not as good at reading these <laughs> as you are. Uh, Code Blooded Rex asks, asks, geez, are we going to talk about hash functions? And yes, we're actually going to start with talking about hash functions um, because I think that's a really good context for the blockchain um, discussion. And then we'll bring up some pictures uh, via Google and we will <laughs> kind of use that to contextualize. Uh, we'll use hash functions and talking about that even on your own laptop um, to discuss how a blockchain is kind of created. Um, we'll go into a little bit of the technical aspect of that, but probably not too much because there are many different implementations and I think the technical part is not as important as the intuition behind it um, for the purposes of our talk. And then we'll talk into like cryptocurrency and we'll talk specifically about Bitcoin, um, but also like Ethereum and um, Monero and things like that. And then I think we'll dive into the kind of ethical and interesting applications of all of the above. To me, certainly, most of these words don't mean much. <laughs> and that's okay. We're going to try and It's a very mystical this, world. Uh, but I did, I did recently hear about how blockchain is kind of like this directional hash function. Yeah, kind <laughs> yeah. Of. that actually it's, is a really a, good way of putting it. It's, <laughs> and it's a very simple idea, actually. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Um, but it would be cool to uh, yeah. talk about it a little bit more in detail. <laughs> Um, Abic Knight asks, are you going to make your own hash function or just use the ones that are already in the market? We will, we will be using hash functions that already exist on my laptop. Uh, <laughs> we, we could actually, you know what, uh, I think for the purposes of that question, we will make our own simple hash functions to demonstrate the concept, um, and then we'll use some actual ones to make things a little bit more uh, realistic. But um, yeah, it, it's, hash function as a concept, I think it sounds very complex and it sounds very um, difficult and technical, but 
the real like concept behind a hash function is really not too crazy. Um, you can make some very simple hash functions that retain all the properties of a hash function. Um, yeah, and actually, let's let's talk about hash functions. Sure. So, what do you know about hash function? Um, I know a hash function is typically some sort of mathematical operation on a data structure. It can be yep. different kinds of data structures. It can be a string. It can be an integer that produces typically a string, um, okay. and there's some sort of mathematical. Um, the algorithm essentially for doing it is such that you get a nice distribution of data, such yeah, that you don't get the same point. thing. <laughs> you don't get the, the basically uh, all your data collapsing into the same hash because then essentially yeah. you haven't optimized your sort right. of access to data at all. Uh, yeah, that, exactly. That's essentially what a hash function is. That's actually, I think, a very like very technical definition. Um, that's a, that's a very uh, turns one complete thing definition. into another thing. Yeah, pretty much, um, and it removes some information. Yeah, right? in a in a way that. Means that we kind of what Hol Colton talked about. Man, I am messing up English all over the place. You, to be um, fair, you are recovering from a <laughs> very dramatic. Yeah, it's sickness. been a, it's been a week. Um, <laughs> but one of the kind of best properties of a hash function is that it's this uniqueness, right? So if I put in x and I get out some y, um, some other z being put in will not give me that same y. Um, and so that's kind of a mathy way of putting it, but what that really means is if you hand me the hashes, um, so that's the result of a hash function, of two different inputs, I can distinguish the inputs, but I couldn't tell you what those inputs were. Right, it's an irreversible function. Exactly. Um, and so a really bad, yeah, in theory, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> um, and some hash functions are less irre irreversible than others, um, but any like decent, any hash function that has kind of these basic properties is irreversible. Um, so, for example, a really bad hash function, um, but one that does technically work, is List one will hash from a string to an integer. Um, and so given some string input, I can create a hash function that um, just returns to me the ASCII representation or the ASCII number uh, for the first letter um, of the string. Unless you get a joke and say you, <laughs> it's you, kind you, of you the, do the, first the hash joke function. hash function. <laughs> um, and so, you know, if I were to give you uh, the string a Bitcoin is worth a lot versus the blockchain is very important, those two strings will hash two different values. Right. Um, however, these hash functions are not very good, and they, the reason, the way that I can evaluate that kind of mentally is based on something else that Colton said, which is that there's this uniformity of distribution. Um, and so what that means is everything, uh, if you were to represent everything as numbers, the output should be fairly uniformly distributed. Um, and then the uniqueness part is that each of these kind of categories um, across which is distributed should be very small. They should only contain one or zero elements, really. And you would never, you wouldn't have a good distribution with a function like you're describing because no, there no. are not a lot of <laughs> words in uh, sentence starters in English that speak with Z right, or, or X, J or but a ton. <laughs> and then would like T, M, E, A. Yeah, exactly. So, you have um, and so your nice. distribution would look like yeah. this, and it's pretty easy for me to kind of intuit if you give me a weird one, like something that did start with Z, I could actually know, I would know some information um, about your input. Um, and so the more uniform the distribution, um, the more I can actually, or the less information I get um, is the idea. And so hash functions should retain as little information about the original input um, as possible. And so CodeBlood uh, Rex asks, how can a function be irreversible? Um, and basically, it's the way I like to think of it is it removes some information, um, some key information from whatever input you give me. So there's another example where this is, a, again, a very kind of simple hash function, um, but an interesting one, in that let's say I get any number, um, any given any input, and I just return as my result of my hash um, zero. So I, I think it's a joke that Andre just said. Oh, well, OK, yes. <laughs> so Andre actually has just put optimistic hash wouldn't work then, um, which is basically just return a constant, uh, return one. I like return zero, but that also works. Um, so you have no information on the input. Um, you also can then no longer distinguish inputs, so that property of our hash function is no longer uh, available. But you have technically removed information. Um, and so I guess to Bob Knight's point, I think from above, uh, or a question really was explaining which properties of hash functions are good, um, and I think it's right there, yeah, um, according to application. And so we're talking about making things cryptographically secure. Um, and so there is a property in cryptography known as like, um, well, cryptographically secure would work as a definition, um, which basically means that we have no information. Um, so if you have Alice and Eve um, as two like parties who are, or we'll say Alice, Bob, and Charlie, because it's ABC. Um, so let's say Alice and Bob are trying to talk to each other, um, communicate some information. Then for something to be completely secure, 
um, Charlie, the eavesdropper on our messages, could actually intercept a message and have literally no information. Um, meaning that if I were to quantify it as like Shannon information, uh, my information is zero. Um, I get nothing out of grabbing or intercepting a message. And so RSA is an example of something that can do that. Um, if you're doing like group secret sharing, the exclusive or of an input message and a series of random keys will also do that um, over in expectation, basically. Um, so there's these properties of hash functions that I don't get any information about the original contents but they retain their uniqueness. Um, they are relatively uniformly distributed. Um, so in expectation, their distribution goes towards a uniform distribution, not towards a normal. Um, and then they have this property of um, any small change retains that uniqueness. Um, is I, I think a key property that we will dive into a little bit with some of our examples, where it, let's say that Colton and I, um, I send you a message um, and our, inter, our eavesdropper uh, changes one bit of data in that message. Uh, so a very small change, you know, not even a change, that's like a change from the letter A to the letter B. Um, and so you and I as people, if our message is maybe several paragraphs of text, uh, maybe no one knows, and um, that one change over time, maybe they eventually spell out some meaningful message and they modify something between the two of us. That's it's a, important. Um, well, if we are using a hash function that cannot distinguish between a one bit of information change, um, then we're, we're kind of screwed, right? Like I, it's, it's important that our hashing function um, can distinguish between the two. And then uh, my natural question, I guess, in this example is, well, how are you going to use a hashing function to make this meaningful? Well, let's say Colton and I have another method of communication that is not subject to being eavesdropped on. Um, and you can actually make that possible. You can make that happen. Um, but this method of communication is less efficient. Uh, maybe it's very slow. Or I can only communicate small amounts of information. Well, then maybe it's important to me um, as the sender of the original message. So I take my message. I hash it using some hash function. Um, and then I take this hash, which is a much smaller string. It's much less information. Um, and it actually just kind of represents that information but is not the same. Um, and I pass that to Colton through this side channel. Um, and then through the main channel, I give him my message. Uh, our eavesdropper steals that message, inter intercepts it, changes that one bit, and then hands it to Colton. Um, now Colton's going to take, this using the same hashing algorithm, a hash of that message. Um, and he's going to compare it with the hash that I sent him. And if those hashes are different, then he knows the message has been altered between me and him. Are you describing Tiffy Hillman? Um, yes, basically. Oh, okay. uh, so that is the premise for DH, uh, which is a way of authenticating changes between messages um, between two people. Um, it is also kind of the premise between signing something with a certificate, is I can validate using your certificate that this message has not been changed. Um, it's also the premise for blockchain, which is that given some uh, message, which is actually just the transaction history or the um, chain of blocks, and each block represents a series of transactions um, that has been signed by someone. And these signs are just hashes. Um, given at that point in time, I hash either the entire thing or part of it at this time, combine the hashes possibly, um, and then sign it to myself. So you're not given one summed hash, you're sort of given a, a history of hashes, and then you use multiple of them? And I'm Generally, say it can, it usually. Can vary depending yeah, on. it tends to be different from chain to chain, um, but usually a blockchain will be a series of hashes, actually. Okay. Um, and they each kind of help you decide um, has a transaction been altered in the past? Um, and since any one bit of information changing, uh, which is basically the most discrete we can get with this information, um, and as literally just anybody's transferring information, um, it cannot get more discrete than one bit-ish, um, then even if you were to modify a very small amount, uh, we can detect that change and invalidate your transaction. Um, we can say, nope, that doesn't count. And that is kind of the premise. Um, it is. Uh, I think a lot more intuitive nowadays than it was when it was invented, uh, which is kind of how that thing that works. Um, but basically, being able to tell um, based on some kind of collective, almost democratic uh, way of authenticating things, um, we can, without loss of any information or security or secrecy, we can all collectively see and validate um, whether or not something has been changed. And that's, that's super important to us. So we're actually going to demonstrate some hash functions, I think, to uh, clarify, crystallize that concept uh, from the abstract. And also East London, Burn Spore 2, Nordic Cucumbers, <coughs> Chat, Call, Mohammed Spicer, Stolopidus, uh, Mohammed Idris, and Muskansta. <laughs>
Thank you all very much for awesome. the follows. Um, and East London saying, hey guys, thanks for the stream. Very interesting for me. Surprised to see such <laughs> topics on Twitch. This might be, huh. I don't know if this is, the, uh, there could have been prior <laughs> Um, blockchain talks, but I'm guessing it's probably pretty rare to probably see it. Not too often. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, what if the hash right. is intercepted also with the message? Right. So basically, there exist ways of uh, manipulating this kind of communication channel. Um, a way that you are probably very familiar with by accident is uh, HTTPS. So let's say that there is, uh, this is also where we get into a little bit different form of encryption, um, where like RSA or SSL works kind of under the same premise. Um, there's this kind of asymmetric uh, style to it where I can have a public versus a private key. Um, and mathematically, basically using properties of prime numbers and co-prime numbers, I can say, hey, here's a public key. Um, I'm going to just distribute this to everyone. Um, and then when you get my message, um, you can use my public key to validate that I signed it or hashed it or um, kind of encrypted it, um, you can actually use your, my public key to unencrypt the message, um, which I encrypted using my private key. Um, and so these public and private key pairs are linked mathematically, but you are not able to alter the message um, in any meaningful way, in any predictable way um, between me and you. And so that creates a secure communication channel. Um, and from that, you can then continue this communication. Uh, that basically creates that side channel, uh, basically. Um, Babbitt was asking, um, is this sort of how software authentication works with SHA? Yeah. Um, and so they question dealing with SHA, which I, again, do not remember the acronym, but there is kind of the SHA 1 through X uh, algorithms, where basically the SHA algorithm is going to say, hey, there's this way of computing a hash. So SHA-1 is doing that hash once. Um, and then there are the other SHA through Xs, where you basically then compute, uh, recompute that hash over and over again. Um, now you may say, oh, well, in the hashes that you described, um, you would actually end up just with nothing. Um, right? Like I can't just chop off numbers over and over again, and eventually it stops working. Um, but SHA is an interesting algorithm in that its result is always the same length. Um, and that actually is like physical length. Um, the string that is returned is the same length. Um, and so there's some, some hashes uh, that have this property, um, and it's a very desirable property, where if I encrypt 4 million uh, letter input versus, like, or let's say an entire file versus a single string, I get the same length of output. Um, and that's, that's crazy, that's wild. Um, and that, that algorithm is particularly useful in doing what is this kind of like authentication of messages, except the messages are like software. So very commonly you'll see on a website, um, they might have a SHA-256 sum or an MD5 sum, which is what we'll actually use in a couple seconds. And they have that hash just displayed on their website, um, and then they also will distribute the software to you, and you're kind of intended to um, take the uh, sum after you've downloaded the software, hash using the same algorithm on your own laptop, and compare the sums, um, and they should be the same. Now, that assumes that the website has not been hacked um, and that displayed some changed. But generally, um, at that point, everything's compromised. It doesn't really matter. You, literally, you should just not trust that software. Um, and I think in general, you really shouldn't trust a whole lot of software. <laughs> but um, thank you. SHA stands for Secure Hash Algorithm. Makes uh, perfect sense. Burnsport2 asked, um, or said, I like the background. How can I get a hold of it? I'm referring <laughs> to your screensaver. And is cybersecurity its own major, or does computer science major come first? Oh. Very cool. Um, so the background is actually just called C Matrix. That's the, uh, well, it's C Matrix piped into Lolcat. Um, I think Lolcat is hilarious and very funny and cool. Um, and then C Matrix basically takes the concept from the Matrix movies and makes it into a reality on your screen. Um, the actual Matrix movies, I believe, used a Japanese cookbook as their basis, um, which is kind of funny. But um, this one just uses normal ASCII characters. Um, and then as far as cybersecurity as its own major or computer science coming first, um, Harvard actually doesn't offer a cybersecurity major. We only offer computer science, but um, as far as those two go. Um, but many schools do offer a cybersecurity major or even more specific kind of subset majors, um, like network administration or network security, things like that. Um, it is, I guess, somewhat to our disadvantage that we don't offer that um, in, excuse me, in like a concept or a conceptual way. But I think that in reality, um, we don't suffer too much from not having a particular major dedicated to cybersecurity. Though I would love to have some more cybersecurity oriented classes, uh, but we do have some professors who are dedicated to cybersecurity, and I think it works out. <laughs> Turns um, out that Adam's going to be an internet gongle. 
Oh, very cool. Um, I do not know Gungle. Um, Ron Lanyadis and Gungle's but that a great is very company. funny. <laughs> not as good as Google, though. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Well, you know, I think Google could... There's some things they can improve. <laughs> there are many things they can improve. Cold-blooded Rex, which language must one focus on to get into cybersecurity? Um, probably English is, I think, the biggest Unexpected. Language. Uh, yeah, right. so, or I mean... PHP. Every time. With the rainbow, rainbow cap up. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. Um, I, so I think... It's kind of interesting in that I think a lot of cybersecurity actually deals with people um, and kind of configuring things correctly. Um, and I think that that's kind of a strange thing to hear. Um, because yes, there are these kind of very complex and difficult algorithms and bug exploits and things. Um, but for example, an exploit that I saw um, that actually dealing with blockchain and dealing with how to steal people's Bitcoin wallet um, locations, the private key version. Just the old classic Saturday um, evening. Yeah, casual things that I'm reading while, you know, feverish. And, yeah. and, uh, um, this uh, company was, uh, I'm trying to remember the names of these companies. Uh, they used a JavaScript package, um, a node package, that um, I think is for like email uh, forwarding or something. It, it was like a kind of a random package. Uh, it was not like useful in terms of like directly in cyber or directly in um, cryptography or whatever, but it was used by a lot of people. Um, and the attackers, they asked for, they literally emailed the maintainers of this package and asked for permission to, uh, to be the owners of it, um, which is hilarious because then it was granted to them. <laughs> they literally just asked nicely, and then the maintainers of the package handed them permission and control over the package. Um, and they inserted some malicious code, and then they rolled back that version so that the most current version was the non-malicious version, but one version back, which they had had as the main version for like a day, um, was the malicious version. And the reasoning that that worked, or the way that that worked, was they were apparently aware that this cybersecurity company, uh, I believe it started with a C, or this cryptography company, um, used daily builds of, uh, of node libraries. And so what they ended up actually doing was they incorporated this uh, kind of malicious code, and it came in, I believe, a three-part payload. So the first part kind of just like pulled the next parts in, um, and it was kind of hilarious in how clever it was. Like it was kind of just like this, this group or these people had put in so much um, time and energy. It was like a fairly well-planned out attack. Um, and is dedicated towards this one company. And, um, and I believe that it ended up kind of getting resolved and fixed or whatever. But yeah, it's a, this is a problem with like, open source. And it's not really a problem. I mean, okay, wait. Uh, to say that is a vague and gross overgeneralization. Um, it is a possible shortcoming of over open source software. And as has been pointed out by, um, I believe, East London, um, People don't really, like the authors for open source packages are basically expected to maintain packages with the same quality and dedication of someone who is getting paid, um, but they do not get paid and often do not get credit even in the right places. Um, and I'm sure I'm guilty of doing that to open source authors, and I'm so sorry. Um, they have dedicated hours to building beautiful, beautiful things it's for gonna us come to back. use. It's going to come back around. Don't Every worry. time. I'm sure that... <laughs> I will probably end up building a package, and hopefully many people will use it, and I'm sure some people will not credit me, and that's okay. Uh, people will turn it into a Trojan. Yeah, I mean, it'll, I, people just kind of brutalize all these packages. <laughs> um, but it is kind of an interesting thing to be worried about, um, especially as many of these kind of cryptography startups and um, blockchain startups rely on open source um, and do not create their own proprietary software. Um, and I don't, you know, I mentioned this before in these Twitches, but basically just, I don't know how much I would want to vocally and logically trust um, most software um, if I didn't build it. But even if I did build it, I don't know how much I would trust it either. Uh, so I think that there's just Different this reasons. healthy paranoia. Yeah, <laughs> as you know, one of them is because I don't personally uh, build very great software. And we have a but... special guest here with us today. <laughs> Welcome. Hey, hey. See if we can squeeze you Sorry in. Sorry to yeah. interrupt. Hop right in. <laughs> I feel like there's a bit of deja vu. I thought we already did this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Nick's going to get you violently yeah, we're, uh, sick. He's recovering from a terrible flu. Trying to actually... Uh, go through the entire stream this time instead of just oh, a Q&A. Oh, that's Fingers crossed. Yeah, instead of yeah. just partially. Yeah. We're talking about crypto today now. <laughs> yeah, I heard. I got a lot to learn myself, so I'm looking forward. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I'll catch yeah, you all well, in the live stream. But good to see everyone there. Sorry to interrupt the chat. Cool. Thanks for popping yeah, up. No, thank you for stopping by. <laughs>
And then I think someone was saying... <laughs> there are many chats. Um, I think someone was saying something about... Um, oh, yeah, Ying Yang was saying a public key can be derived from a private key, but never vice versa. Yeah. Uh, and that's... I would say, given the like RSA style of doing it, where you use prime numbers, uh, that is true. Um, you can derive a private key, or sorry, a public key from a private key, uh, but it is kind of an essential property that you cannot go the other way. Um, so private keys are kind of intended as like a private. I only I will have access to my own private key. Um, whereas a public key, I can give that to anyone. Um, you're all welcome to have my public keys. In fact, uh, I can pull up my public key from my laptop, and you're all welcome to copy that into your SSH. I mean, uh, browsers even the, uh, with files. certificates, <laughs> SSL certificates, they'll show you the the, yeah. the key in the Anytime. certificate. Yeah. It's it's readily available. Uh, pri public keys are used to kind of validate um, things about the person who is attempting to log in or pass secure information or. Um, basically, the person who wants to be trusted, they can use their public key to be trusted by other people. Um, and so, like SSH, for example, is a kind of very easy example of using a public and private key pair to authenticate you to whatever you're trying to SSH into. So, uh, for my machine, I have a private key on my machine, actually, probably several. Um, and then I give you a public key, and I say, here you go. This will validate that I am who I say I am. And then I can log in to that other machine. Um, because when I log in, I present my private key, and I say, hey, um, this is a thing that we, I'm, I'm correct, I'm valid, I'm valid based on what I gave you before. And then you take your private public key, and you say, yep, you match. Um, there's an algorithm for matching them and making sure that, well, not really matching them, but so much as performing a computation that validates them. Um, and from there, I am now allowed to log in. Um, Cool. So that is kind of a little bit about public key, private key, hashing, and some kind of light touching on blockchain. Um, Lince Paraguara says, blockchain is a hyped word, don't you think? And I say, yes, of course. <laughs> um, many things in CS, I think, are overhyped and or overgeneralized. Um, and I think, I mean, I personally am guilty of using words um, Actually, yeah, that's a that's a true sentence on its own. I am I'm personally guilty of using, <laughs> guilty words. Of using words. I am also personally guilty of using uh, technical jargon in a way that is kind of, um, we'll say, maligned. Um, it's not necessarily intended poorly, but I think that a lot of times people will hand wave stuff um, to just try and make a different point, um, and the point that actually comes across is, well, up to interpretation. So blockchain in particular and Bitcoin um, get overhyped in a sense uh, basically because they ended up being very, well, tied to money. Um, I think almost anything that is tied to lots and lots of money um, will get overhyped or attract a lot of attention from the public in general. Um, and you'll have a lot of people who will then talk about those things um, and will spread misinformation about them. Um, and so if you like do a quick Googling about you know, what are the biggest uses for blockchain, um, you can pretty clearly see where people lack creativity um, and or don't actually understand what some of the kind of powers of those things are. Um, and so you might see someone advocating that you can uh, encrypt everything. I don't know what that would mean, but you could in concept. Um, but I could do that before blockchain. Um, and so there's this kind of idea of like, well, you can create more currencies. Um, and that is technically true. I, I don't know why you would do things like that, but um, you could. And I think Andre's, Andre's uh, point and joke here where he says, uh, what do you mean overhyped? By the way, check out my blockchain-powered machine learning artificial general intelligence chatbot. Um, and I think that's a perfect example of how people will say, um, oh, no, but I technically understand these things, and then they'll throw them all together in words. And I don't know how many of you have read um, scientific papers. I am forced to read them as part of my classes. Um, but a lot of these journals and papers, they do not have titles um, that are nearly as fun. <laughs> they generally are like, here is a you know, SHA-256 algorithm breakdown for um, this particular subset of the real world. And I think that, that my, my point in saying that is basically that um, these topics are fairly complex, and even very brilliant people, like uh, the people who do research here, uh, will focus in on like one very particular subset of those topics and break it down. And there's enough there that they can write these 12, 20, 400 page papers, books basically, on that one subset concept. Um, so like, you could take any one database management system and then write a paper on just how it works and why it works the way it does. Um, so blockchain as a general concept um, can be explained and can be written in one paper. Um, but then any one particular application of blockchain, you can do the same.
Um, so we're gonna let's let's do some hashing. Um, I think that that's a fun way to get started on things. Um, I'll make my screen a little bit bigger. We have a massive chat going on, by the way, about Gongle and Gongle script. <laughs> I, I do kind of see that. And C uh, minus or, minus, uh, which transpiles to uh, <laughs> to, to Gongle script. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, there are. <laughs> If you are kind of reading the chat, um, there is a very funny <laughs> side conversation going on at the moment. Um, yeah, I, I think that you should read it, and it's kind of like an Easter egg um, for this whole <laughs> this whole chat. Do you know uh, Takoshi Takakoto? Um, okay, so Takoshi, as far as um, I'm aware, is kind of the pseudonym for the inventor of Bitcoin um, and the publisher of the Bitcoin white paper. However, the reality um, is that no one has effectively, I have not been convinced that anyone, of any of the people who have claimed Bitcoin um, have successfully done so. Um, I, I'm under the impression that many of the people who claim to have invented Bitcoin and blockchain are kind of after the hype and not after the actual kind of intellectual power behind it and kind of interestingness behind it. Um, but I wouldn't want to kind of accuse anyone of lying. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, I kind of do. Anyone who claims to be that person is also pretty much a straight liar. <laughs> uh, so I'm having the there. hardest time not laughing my ass off right now. It, it's very Because <laughs> minus, minus minus C, I prefer in literally an inverted C. That is, wow. How did you, you know, sometimes <laughs> people on the internet, they kind of just like the faceless people on the internet are magical. Like you guys just go and find things um, so e so quickly. It is ra it's mind blowing. Um, Bob Knight says, recently I watched the math lecture of uh, MIT 6.042J. Um, oh, from the J term class. Uh, they talked about this kind of stuff, how RSA works. Um, and I don't think you'll be uh, too overwhelmed in the stream. Uh, Colton and I try to make things not overwhelming in the stream. Also, I don't know any Although, of this math. Zero of this math. Yeah, so we're going to not talk too much about the math. It's not going to happen for me. Um, because the math, though I think the math under RSA and under like MD5 and SHA is actually not too crazy. Um, and actually, you can kind of like manipulate it with your hand. Uh, hmm, well, that's a weird way of putting it. Maybe I am a little still sick. Uh, you can kind of uh, draw it out in pictures, and it tends to not be too terrible. Uh, the algorithms themselves are actually um, kind of eloquent. Uh, they're not too long. You can actually implement a toy version of RSA in roughly a, maybe 50 lines of code or less. Um, I mean, you can do that in Python in 50 lines of code or so. Um, so most of these things are really not known for their length complexity. Um, they are generally known for being very eloquent, interesting, kind of beautiful uh, solutions to these problems. The string function in Python, that's, 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 that's it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just that. It's just literally just like one line of code. It is kind of impressive, I think. Um, well, I mean, of course it is impressive. <laughs> yeah. Um, so on most uh, Linux machines, you do have a program called MD5, uh, or Unix-style machines. Um, and MD5 allows you to calculate the MD5 checksum for any file um, on your machine. And actually, I believe any string you can also pass in. But we're going to use some files. Um, and I think that files are an interesting use case for this because they're they're very large um, relative to a string or an individual word. And so I think that it's kind of mind-blowing to me that if I change something as small as like a period, um, the MD5 checksum will change. So what I wanted to kind of demonstrate is kind of as granular of a change as I can make, as small and minute and non-consequential of a change as I can make. So we go on to desktop. There are a lot of things on my desktop, <laughs> um, although not in reality. We're going to open a micro Microsoft Word document. Um, oh, that's, that's a text editor. Yeah, that's a, that's a wild text editor. And we're going to generate some lorem ipsum, um, which is one of my favorite ways of doing they things. They have bacon ipsum. They do. Actually, yeah, let's, let's go grab some bacon ipsum. And uh, uh, East London missed their question twice. Are you working somewhere, guys? If no, do you have some ideas in which domain companies you would like to? Um, so yes. Yeah, I believe we're actually both employed this summer. Um, and actually, I guess the question is even more general. It's just, are you working somewhere? Um, technically, we both kind of work for. Uh, 
for a CS50. Yeah. yeah. I'm a technologist here at Harvard University. Nick is an undergrad at Harvard University, also yes. um, teaching fellow for not only CS50, but the MBA's course. Yeah. Um, and other courses, I'm sure you've TF'd other courses here on campus. I've done, I think, quite a bit of TFing work <laughs> at this point. Um, uh, it's quite fun. And Nick uh, got oh, a, a uh, internship at Google yes. for the summer um, as well. Which is where I will be this summer. So congrats to Nick for that <laughs> awesome, you. awesome score. Um, I appreciate that. Gongle on Rails. It's, <laughs> it's going to keep going. This, until is, the end this of the joke stream. is not going anywhere. Gongle um, Ipsum. <laughs> Gongle way better. Ipsum. Way better. So much better than Bacon it's, Ipsum. <laughs> and yeah, so we've generated a 10 page file. Um, this is probably larger and more eloquent than any essay I will ever write. Um, <laughs> Reads about the same. I, we, we say all these jokes, but some of them, eh, all right. <laughs> um, so demo, so You want it to feel like that so that people don't know whether you're just BSing or whether you're being yeah, or very being elegant. Serious. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, well, we'll just script for that. Um, demo, some. And so you'll notice that this, uh, this exists in this doc. And I can say, OK, give me the MD5 sum of that. Um, so now quickly memorize that MD5 sum. Uh, mostly kidding. And, um, and now I'm going to take, we're going to take this period um, and change its font size to 14. Um, enormous change, uh, clearly significant. Devastating. Um, devastatingly big change. Um, and you'll notice that the, ch the checksum changed drastically. Hey, well, hey there's the, um, that last C, though, that, uh, that 4C, that's still the same. Yeah, so yeah, you're, uh, <laughs> there's like at least two letters in there are the same. Yeah, like um, a one in which what is, is kind of like Thirty-seven chance of that happening. Actually, yeah. no capital letters too. Oh no, can um, it only be lowercase letters? Uh, so it is going to always be lowercase oh. letters. It is a hexadecimal number. Um, oh, oh, I see. Right. But um, it, that I think blows my mind. It, it, that's just wild to me that that worked at all. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I knew that was going to work, but it's it's crazy to me, and I think it should be crazy for the foreseeable future, that I can change one very, very small aspect. Um, to a human, that was a non-change. You would not notice, um, I, with high probability. Maybe you're a savant and you would, but most people would not notice. And I, it's kind of a meaningless change, right? I didn't really do anything to your code um, or to your message. But there is kind of a more interesting change um, that I could make, where let's say at the very bottom of the file, I wanted to pass a secret message to my spy within your organization. Um, and so this is probably a very dumb way of doing so. <laughs> nice. But I changed the text color to white. And Could never I, guess there's text there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you would never know, minus <laughs> the weird lines here, um, that I've hidden a message there. But if I do this checksum again, it is again wildly different from the previous ones. And so MD5 is not necessarily the best hashing algorithm anymore. It is, I believe, no longer um, cryptographically secure. There are ways of, there are databases of these checksums where I can go online and brute force a lot of them. Um, but MD5 is still fairly useful. You'll still see it on a lot of websites to validate the software that they hand you. And this is a hashing algorithm. Um, and this is a fairly good one. It was used for quite some time. Um, and I think will still be used for quite some time. There are the SHA-256 like, sums and things. Um, my Mac does not have this command, but I believe if you're on like a Linux machine, you can type SHA-256 sum, and it will, it will compute that sum for you. Yeah, it looks like um, Linz said that in the chat there. Oh, yeah. So Linz has said um, on Ubuntu, you can use MD5 sum and SHA-256 sum, and those will work. Um, and I just don't have that program on my Mac. But I generally will like use Linux machines when I'm downloading software where I would actually be interested in checking the checksums. Um, but it is kind of a very interesting concept um, that I can compute these sums. Um, and it's very easy, right? So this computation of a file, even as kind of large as that one, or I can make it much larger, um, right? Or I can copy this. And I can paste, and eventually we end up with quite a substantial document. Um, this is a 76-page document. Um, you'll notice that for the human, uh, to the human eye, the computation of that checksum did not um, didn't change in speed. It was just as fast as before. And so I think that that is kind of another interesting property: is you want these sums to be calculable very, very quickly. 
um, with the notable exception of Bitcoin, where its sums are not necessarily easy to calculate. Um, but with everything else, it should be very fast. And the reason for that is I want to kind of just like, it's almost like a rule of thumb for the modern age. Um, I want to be able to just check a sum and make sure that they're the same with high, high confidence very quickly. Um, it's very useful. It's nice because you don't have any idea how large the files are, the inputs of your, uh, you know, this particular example, because they all end up being the same exact length. Yes. So there's no information really at all that you can discern just from looking at the string. Right. And I think that that's a good intuition to follow. And you can prove that mathematically there is also very minimal information um, between the two. You just know that they're different. Um, with high probability, they will not collide. So a collision in hashing kind of uh, jargon basically means that they end up two different inputs hashed to the same sum or hashed to the same hash. Um, and that is not great. Um, the occurrence of a collision should be very, very low in probability. Um, and the reason for that is like hashes are also used to validate passwords because of this uniqueness, because of this um, kind of uniform distributed property and lack of information property. I can hash your password, store the hash on my uh, website, and then when every time you log in, I just hash it before it ever gets to me. And then when you transfer, you just transfer the hash. I can compare the hashes and I know if you had the right password, but I don't know what your password was and things like that. Um, but if there's a collision, then maybe I can use the wrong password and it still works. Um, that's no good. So that would be bad. Um, you could then in concept, uh, so these hash functions should be like kind of unpredictable, right? Like, like, unpredictable in the sense that I shouldn't be able to change information about the input in order to change the output in a desired way. Um, so let's say I wanted to get uh, A8 at the end of the hash there. I should have no way to, um, to modify my input such that that always happens. Um, because if I could do that, then I might be able to start formulating idea. Well, actually, you could show mathematically that if you're able to do that, you're actually able to reverse the hash sum. Um, so that, that would be very bad. Um, and in this case, that, that is impossible. You, you cannot do that with MD5, um, which is good. So if you were capable of doing that, it would be very, very bad. Your hash function would be useless, roughly. Pika asked an interesting question. Um, I would really appreciate an example of hash collisions, because I've heard of it, but never really seen it. Sure. Is this something that's easy to demonstrate? Um, so we can take a bad hashing algorithm, yeah, and they the, will have a lot of collisions. That's true. You could so, write, a, you could write the, uh, the old classic <laughs> Nick Wong hash, where yeah. we take the uh, first letter. Yeah, we just take, uh, well, yeah, let's just return the first letter of any string. So um, we'll just define bad hash. <laughs> Great on a string, <laughs> and we'll just return S0. Now, this doesn't do any validation. Sorry for all of the people on YouTube who will dislike this function. Um, but it is literally, by definition, a bad hash. So you know, maybe not my best work. Um, so this will have a collision even for two different inputs. Um, and so that is literally a hash collision. Uh, now, you might go, well, it's not a real hashing function. It doesn't return the. Uh, We'll say a number. Um, hash functions actually don't re aren't required to return a number, but we can do this. Um, and this will also collide. Actually, it will collide with the single input A. Um, and I mean, that's kind of a tongue in cheek slash stupid um, algorithm and demonstration. But technically, uh, it is a collision and it is a hashing function. All of those things are technically true. It illustrates um, that you could scale this up into something more sophisticated that still has these issues. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there was another question that has been asked um, where they, let's see, who asked? Um, Ron Laniato, uh, Ron Laniato, Ron Laniato uh, <laughs> asked, if you change the file after checking MD5, then you go back on that change, will it be the same MD5 as before? Um, so technically, yes. However, Microsoft Word keeps a lot of metadata um, on your files. So I don't know if that will be true. We can find out. Um, so let's MD5 check some of that. Um, now I'll change by deleting an R, so an easily trackable change. And then I'll put that R back. Um, and you might not get the same sum, yeah. So Microsoft Word does retain some uh, metadata and things about the uh, actual file. If you did this to like, yeah, regular, yeah, I was going to say. We'll just do a normal file. Um, I, again, could have done better. Um, Oops. So this is a little bit cleaner way of editing things. Um, cleaner, just that it won't keep too much metadata. Um, and then if I nano it again, and delete the H, 
and then put the age back, this should hash to the same function. Um, and so you can kind of visually compare that this hash and this hash are the same, but the one in the middle is not. And so in that case, there's no like extra complexity um, that is being added by the program that edited it. Edited it? Uh, whereas Microsoft Word does kind of modify things in between. Um, so for like software um, that you distribute online, that will not be an issue. Um, there is no like one editor for software, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, but yeah, generally, <laughs> sorry, there is a post in the chat um, that is hilariously funny, um, probably inappropriate, but as long as, oh, I don't know. Uh, East London says, thanks God, I'm sticking with uh, Microsoft Domestic Mechanic AI um, <laughs> and don't have such problems. Um, you are all on the internet by definition. Microsoft I will domestic, leave that to you <laughs> to go to Google. Um, yeah, yeah. That is very funny. Yeah. Right. That, is, <laughs> that is very funny. It's too hard. Sometimes when we read you guys' comments, this is they're, they're very I've been, I've, been, I've been a little bit of the giggles today. <laughs> so I'm watching this uh, sort of gongle chat as well, which is kind of... The gungle side... Or the least serious stream we've ever had in history. Yeah. Ironically, about one of the coolest topics that we've uh, talked about, or yeah. that I've talked about in a while. I got a shout out. Coding Dan, <clears throat> Space Case Dreamer, Jax Albert, uh, Kamoth RK, Red John 1995, and Odev Zero. Oh, yes. Thank you all yeah, very much. <laughs> What's Adam, the person um, who was starting all the gongle? What's funny? What's so funny? What's hilarious, yeah. <laughs> Which is, I think that's the best, you know, the person that can tell a joke in a straight face, and they're just like, I don't understand. Uh, <laughs> we have some professors like that, but I'm not convinced that they realize why they're funny. <laughs> um, so Vern Spores at the very top there said, uh, what laptop brand and I think model do you think is best for getting into a CS CyberSec major? Um, you don't want to destroy your bank account. That makes sense. I generally also don't want to destroy my bank account. Um, so... It's kind of up to you. A lot of people will have their own personal ideas on that. Um, some people will say, well, Windows is the right solution, or OS X, or System76, or Linux. Um, and the reason that I think that in and of itself as a discussion is funny is because those are different. Like Some of those are like makes of machines. Some of them are operating systems. Um, people will throw all sorts of things at you. Um, I, I think that generally speaking, you should Use systems that work for what you want to do. Um, and so I, you'll hear me say that as an answer frequently. Um, and the reason that for that is that I think most things in the world, most of these tools that we have, are by definition tools. Um, and so you can use tools for the right or wrong purpose. Um, generally, there's a joke about an uh, engineer who walks into a room, boss asks if he can fix a problem, um, and the engineer says, sure, takes out a hammer and taps it, and it fixes it. Um, and the problem is just whatever, you know, is a nail sticking out or something. And then tells the, his boss that, um, you know, that'll be a $10,000 fee. And his boss says, well, I could have done that. And the engineer is like, you're right. Um, it was $1 for actually tapping the, uh, the item. Um, with the hammer, it was $999,000 for knowing where to tap the item. Yeah, I feel like um, I've heard this in a few different incarnations. Yeah. It's definitely a common theme story, um, and it comes up fairly frequently in CS, um, where a lot of times coders will get accused of doing nothing uh, or just copying and pasting from Stack Overflow, for example. Um, and this is a very kind of comically long-winded way of saying that it doesn't necessarily matter uh, which tool you're using. Um, but it does matter depend, like given a scenario. Um, so given a situation or given a task, it does matter what tool you use. But as an abstract concept of like which tool is best, um, I wouldn't be able to with any real confidence or any like semblance of intellect tell you that a tool is just abstractly better than another one. Right. Um, and I think that when you're asking, you know, how do, what is a good computer for CS? Well, I have particular use cases in mind that I know come up frequently in CS for which OS X or any Linux machine would be fairly useful. Um, but there are some cases that I could conjure in my head where a Windows machine would be more useful. Um, for example, your computer science educational institution um, happens to use a Windows network for everything, and all software they distribute is Windows only. Well, it, it may be to your advantage to use Windows for learning in that environment. Um, but I think in general, 
you can pick a tool and make it work for what you need it to do. Um, in this case, I like Linux style machines, but it's up to you. <laughs> All right, so cryptography and um, cyber, well, we'll say cryptocurrencies. Um, let's pull up a image of the blockchain. Um, and we'll do a quick kind of uh, check. There's an image I have in my head that I would like to use. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. And this is where I think the kind of impromptu nature of these streams is really cool. Um, and this in particular is kind of comical <laughs> in that I'm going to go Google an image that you could have also Googled. And we're kind of going to make perfect sense of the story that I just shared um, in that being able to interpret which images make sense and why is fairly useful. Um, let's say blockchain diagram. There's a particular image in my head that I guess I could have, ah, this one. It's particularly simple. Um, it's a very straightforward image. Oh no, that's <laughs> not what I wanted. Uh, and now it's just, can I use the technology I have? Nope. <laughs> Uh, no, I cannot. That's fascinating. Oh, because uh, embedded into it. Yeah, because they embedded like. it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sense. Well, here you go. You you guys are. Oh. Yeah, and they did this. They changed this on me recently. Google Images changed like the way they scale stuff, and I had to figure it out live. Yeah, on I'm really not. A, oh, wow. Well, okay. So I guess you know this is just kind of the just desserts. Yeah, the feeling when Google removed the view full image button. So yeah, annoying. that's annoying. Um, okay. There um, you go. Extension to re-enable it though. That's pretty useful <laughs> actually. That's good to know actually. So um, here you go. Um, this is a very simple text representation, um, probably made in like PowerPoint or so, with um, of the blockchain. And I think that this is kind of really perfect for explaining blockchain. It looks basically like a linked list. <coughs> and yeah, actually, I could you could uh, contextualize it like that. So linked lists, for those that aren't aware, are a data structure in memory. Well, a, a data structure that basically says, hey, I am currently a node. So it might look something like this um, node here. Actually, I just saw someone say, make a screenshot. And I was like, you know, that's a great idea. <laughs> um, oh, nice. Cool. OK, so that was convenient. Um, now I can draw on this. Done? Oh, not what I wanted. Also, sweet comment by ASMR Gaming. Thanks for the great, interesting, useful content, plus all the hard work making this by everyone. Yeah. Very nice. Our comment. pleasure. Or everyone else. I Thank you, know. ASMR Gaming. And also, shout out to David for tuning in. He uh, posted a message up there earlier in the chat. Yeah. Hello, David. <laughs> Welcome. Um, Virtually and physically. So, we got him in the yeah, he, got he was both here digitally. and is now watching, him, which is awesome. So, it's good content. It's, yeah, it's quality I, content. I appreciate it. Um, so, if this were a linked list, uh, this, what I've highlighted, it would be roughly one node on our linked list. Um, and these kind of arrows, OK, yeah. These kind of arrows here would be your pointers to the next item, uh, the next node. Um, so linked lists can be doubly linked. They can be singly linked. They can have, um, they can be looped, like cycles. It's kind of up to the linked list. But we're going to kind of just assume the abstract general definition of a linked list, which is that each node links to the next one, and at the end, it stops. Um, and there is a starting node that you automatically have access to for some reason. So um, those kind of assumptions out of the way. Uh, this is a very reasonable way of approximating a blockchain. Um, and even actually, I, I say approximating, but I, what I really mean is that we're just kind of translating. Uh, we're using it as an analogy, where this is one node. Um, this hash is actually the pointer to the next node, and so on. Um, so basically, a blockchain, in a very kind of boring sense, is really just bookkeeping. Um, so to speak. So I can I can use blockchain um, in concept as just a advanced way of doing accounting and keeping track of where <laughs> things went when. Um, and that may sound like a kind of trivialization of this concept, but I promise you that it's about right. Um, that we are kind of just doing some advanced bookkeeping on where, when, and to whom, and from whom any transaction occurred. Now, each block represents some set of, we'll say, uh, I always hate when math people and CS people do this. They always talk in abstraction. They're like, uh, n transactions that we encrypted with n messages and so on. Uh, they just use random letters in English. Uh, so there's, you know, we can contextualize that to say Sometimes that there's just some English. number. Yeah, they to might just be speaking in like math, uh, which is horrifying. Um, so there's some number of transactions that are kind of kept in this ledger. Um, and it's really an advanced way of doing what you would do with your books in reality. Um, so if I were to like write this down, each page could represent a block. And I then have a special property at the top of each page that says, hey, the previous one is good. 
um, is valid. And if you were to put this into real life, then maybe you have a book, and we're going to call that book the blockchain. And um, each page has been signed by a meticulous human being, has just kind of a severe case of perfectionism, and will find any mistake or any difference um, from what actually happened. And that, that kind of obscure person, um, that abstract third party, that third party for the longest time in history just had to be trusted by us. Um, so you went and just found someone, you know, you paid them five bucks off the street and said, hey, I want you to check this page for any changes from what you saw actually happen. And that's fine. Um, but it means that you and I have to trust that person. You have to trust them, I have to trust them. And we are incentivized to break that trust from the other person's end, right? So I am incentivized to pay them more money than you and get them to alter transactions on my behalf. Um, I'm incentivized literally to infinity <laughs> in that I can gain infinite amounts of money, uh, well, infinite. I can gain money until you catch on and you will be none the wiser. Uh, because the person that we trust breaks, breaks that trust. So one of the biggest concepts of blockchain and under Bitcoin, underlying Bitcoin, was that that third person becomes everybody. It's no longer, and this is where people are like, well, that's crazy. And I agree, that is crazy. Um, that's, that's, that's the beautiful part of this, is that we place the trust in kind of the crowd, in the mob, which in, in English, that sounds like a horrible idea. Why would you ever trust a crowd of crazy people to just authenticate these transactions. These are millions of dollars moving around. But the reason that you can do that is this hashing idea. So any one person in concept, and I say one in quotes because in reality now it's like pools of people and like a business really that do it, but it's okay. In concept it was one person. Any one person could calculate a hash um, and that hash validates this entire transaction. And now, well, this entire series of transactions, history of transactions. Um, and once I've done that, I have now signed this block and I can then transition us to the next block. Um, and the kind of, one of the other cool concepts behind Bitcoin and blockchain was you should get, that, that's work. You're putting in kind of effort and time or some resource that you cannot get back. So calculation is a resource. It requires time and in reality it requires like electricity and money. Um, but that's a resource and so you should get paid for this work. And what better way to pay you than um, in giving you a small transaction on this blockchain. And, um, and you just validated it so we know it's good and you get some money, you get some Bitcoin for example. Um, and so that I think is a very kind of clever, but clever in the same way of like RSA or whatever um, encryption algorithm in that it's not that crazy. Um, it's not that wild. It doesn't require millions of little steps, um, at least not at the high level. It's just elegant, right? You get paid for work and your work kind of self reinforces that that pay was valid. Um, I, I think that that is, is kind of the eloquent conceptualization of blockchain. It's a nice sort of way of enforcing that everyone is kind of looking out for themselves too. Yeah. And like, I think that's the greatest sort of motivation I think for most people. <laughs> yes. Most people only really care about themselves. <laughs> so when you can tie that into a system that helps everybody yeah. out, it's kind of a beautiful thing. It's a well incentivized system. Yeah. Um, and I think that that, it just leverages the fact that human beings are very self interested. Um, by definition, and they it, they even struggle to become slightly less self-interested for like children and spouses. <laughs> Humans are very selfish, um, yeah. and I think that this self-interest means that they're going to, or they're going to always act in their own self-interest. Um, and I think if you just kind of accept that behavior, then this way of um, creating a currency is super useful. So. Bitcoin is an interesting case where the original conceptualization was, I believe the like phrase was like one CPU, one vote. Um, you have one CPU cycle and you, or one kind of physical CPU and the number of cycles it contributes, you get a vote in this online democracy of currency. Now, I think that that was a great original conceptualization that has been broken um, by the fact that Bitcoin can pretty much only be mined now realistically um, by ASICs, 
which are dedicated chips that can compute the SHA-256 hash sum um, very, very quickly. And so what you're basically doing when you mine a cryptocurrency, at least Bitcoin, um, is we're trying to contribute to these blocks. We're trying to sign um, blocks in waiting. So it's a series of transactions in kind of the global scale where I want to um, validate those transactions. So I'm participating, if I'm mining, in the democratic process of building these beautiful blocks. Um, and I want some currency myself in exchange for doing that. And so when I go and do that and I go and compute these hashes, um, the Bitcoin conceptualization was, well, you're contributing work, you get paid, um, and your work contributes to the validity of the system. So it is well incentivized. Um, now, originally you could do this with a CPU. A uh, short while after you could do it with a GPU, which is the graphics kind of equivalent. Um, and then after that, it kind of became these like farms of GPUs and ASICs. And I would say that you as an individual are probably not given, um, you're not given the kind of democratic freedom anymore. Kind in of scaled Bitcoin. up a lot. Yeah. It, and that makes sense. I think incentivizing anything with money, especially if that money can then be made real world money, um, people are like, ooh. I'm going to just hop right on that and you attract the attention of big businesses and things. So part of the challenge of creating more stable and kind of more kind of true to their purpose cryptocurrencies is um, how do I prevent the difficulty of mining from going up um, such that an individual with a laptop could always still mine them. But I don't want um, someone who has, you know, four million laptops to be able to mine them to earn infinite currency. How do I scale this depending on you know, that parameter set? And it's quite difficult. Um, that problem I don't think has been effectively solved. Um, you have cryptocurrencies like Monero where it does kind of prevent that problem um, in that it keeps roughly the same difficulty. Um, there are some cryptocurrencies well, I can't think of an example at the moment, but that might just because I'm tired, um, where recovery. the uh, difficulty scales up and then drops back down, and then scales up and then drops back down. So on average, the difficulty is here, um, and on average, the difficulty is such that a, current, like a company wouldn't gain a significant advantage, but in any given moment, there is some group that has an advantage. That's an interesting way of doing it. Um, there are some cryptocurrencies that are no longer based on the proof of work of authenticating the transaction. Um, but rather are based on um, other work. So the proof of work concept, which basically says you do some work and then I pay you in kind to the work that is being validated, um, is very interesting um, as a concept. And it was definitely, I would say, pioneered by the Bitcoin paper. Um, it has been taken to be a little bit more general now, so it's not always CPU cycles. Maybe I offer up storage space. Um, and so this is a currency that I can think of off of, um, that I've seen their white paper uh, from Storge, uh, or Storge, and they do a pretty cool job of, uh, their white paper is worth reading, on how to network storage devices, um, and your proof of work is being on that network, being part of it for some period of time. Uh, and what I do is I say, hey, you can use up to X gigabytes of my hard drive space, so disk space, not memory, um, and you are allowed to use it to store whatever information you'd like. Now, no code is being executed, but you can store data in any way, shape, or form, and I get paid in your cryptocurrency for this. And I believe the way that theirs works is the longer you're on the network, the higher your proof of work, and so on. Um, but yeah, you can do all sorts of interesting uh, things with that. Now, there are some other conceptualizations that are saying, hey, there are these very computationally heavy tasks that are not easy to scale, not easy to perform. Is it possible for us to take a task like this, um, let's say uh, performing whole genome sequence analysis on whole genome sequencing data, uh, which is about three gigs, give or take. Uh, it's a typical depends. Saturday. Yeah, you know, the things you do on like a Sunday night. Um, and um, we want to perform this sequencing analysis on real, in real time um, on data as it flows in from our related hospital. 
Well, that's a pretty difficult task. Um, almost, almost impossible at the moment. And there are some computational resources that could probably do it pretty well, but they're not necessarily going to retain that real timeness as it scales. So is it possible for me to outsource that? Um, because the number of comp computational resources in a room, or sorry, I just read a comment and said in a room, uh, in the world are enormous relative to any one organization, even if that organization has like a supercomputer. So is it possible for me to outsource these computations um, in such a way that everyone is very strongly incentivized to kind of play against other people, um, and that incentive system works to then benefit them. Um, and so there are some previous examples that predate like Bitcoin of like scientists using the kind of global CPU resources, extra cycles uh, was how they phrased it, to compute to compute different configurations of proteins. That's another very computationally heavy task um, that is very difficult. And the I think one of the reasons that this was not a super successful idea was the incentive system was not set up. Um, the incentive system was you will be part of a scientific research project. Um, which it's is not going to work with humans. Never going to work. I mean, <laughs> some people, you know, there are some like really good people out there who are like, cool. It's not going to work at scale. Yeah, yeah, it just doesn't work across, you know, America. Uh, so that I think that if you were to then swap that system for a cryptocurrency-based one where you're incentivized to not only kind of operate against all the other individual operators, but you're very strongly incentivized to operate for yourself, um, that would work quite well. So it's basically just a way of contextualizing it into this format um, at this point. Have now, you talked about um, Ron Ladiato? I don't know if you touched on it already, but um, the actual way the computer validates transactions? Oh, um, so actually, IG Riley has put uh, fairly well that transactions are signed by the sender uh, using a private key that was also used to create the public key in a previous transaction. Um, that way, anyone can take the transaction, hash it, and then determine whether the public key and signature are from the same private key. Um, so. Basically, what that process that was just described um, is this pointer aspect. Um, so actually, let's say that we do this. I don't really know how to highlight this to demonstrate exactly what I want to do. Um, but you take this segment, um, the header portion in this image, but really just kind of some form of signature or hash. Um, and then my laptop, and really, we'll say my computational resources, um, can then say, hey, that looks valid. Um, and that's your question is, you know, how do I actually perform that validation? Um, you can think of the example with SSH from before or just kind of this concept of using public versus private keys where I retain my own private key and each block has its own kind of private key. Um, but the public key is available to me and I can say, hey, does this make sense given um, the kind of hashed keys uh, that are available to me? So there is a computation that I can perform um, that says, hey, these are, they match uh, or they don't. And if they don't, then I can reject the transactions. Um, now, the kind of assumption is that if they don't match, then there is some set of transactions, there are some subset of those transactions that do work and are valid, um, and there's just an invalid one somewhere. How far back but, do you usually calculate? Um, all of them. Uh, so that's the other cool thing is I can't change any single block um, without these hashes becoming invalid. And that is kind of that property of any one bit changing our kind of MD5 hash sum, for example. Um, going back and changing any one transaction means that the resulting hashes, as they propagate forward, will then also be changed. Right. And now it is completely invalid. Um, so that invalidates the entire block. So you get uh, the to invalidate chain, the actually. last five? You have to like go back to the start of the it's block? It's just kind chain? of forever, yeah, wow. okay. um, which is very cool. And actually, they point out, well, then, uh, shouldn't validation be very easy? And uh, if you remember kind of my point about MD5 being very quick, regardless of size, um, that is true. But um, that wouldn't make for a very interesting proof of work. So what ended up actually happening is um, for a while, it was quite easy. The mining or the block time, uh, the time to mine one block um, was actually quite fast. It was like 10 minutes or something. Um, it is no longer that easy because it is enormous. Um, and so this algorithm does not scale super well in kind of asymptotics. Um, but generally when we say an algorithm has asymptotically like O of n squared or O of n, we don't really care. The difference between O of n and O of n squared in logistic time when your measurement results in nanoseconds or microseconds doesn't really matter. Um, because to the human being, to the human eye, that's, that's, no, that's kind of small peanuts. 
But when you're talking about something that scales to the order of millions or billions, um, it does start to matter because a billions multiplier to a microsecond starts to be like real time, like noticeable um, to the human. And so after enough transactions, um, and this is validating any transaction that occurs, um, you start to have quite a few um, available. And so one of the kind of downsides to Bitcoin um, is that for an individual to try and compute these blocks is almost impossible now. There is a probabilistic element to it in that you can join mining pools and one of you might compute the block correctly, um, and then that continues on. Um, and so IG Riley has said, respectfully, Bitcoin still takes about 10 minutes, and if it doesn't, it adjusts, I think, every 2,000 blocks to get back to around 10 minutes. Um, that sounds about right. Um, and what I'm actually, I guess, pointing at is how much can an individual person do? So it was at some point at the original conception that an individual could calculate a block, um, could validate an entire block, and then push that onto the actual chain, uh, to the network. However, that is, I would say, realistically impossible um, for the individual. Um, so Bitcoin's kind of conceptualization does not work well for um, individuals over time. But it works well as kind of a concept. Um, <coughs> I think it is currently basically run by several companies, um, like a handful of businesses who have these kind of mining farms for uh, Bitcoin. And that is, I think, a breakdown of the philosophical benefit to uh, Bitcoin, which was the democratic exchange of a currency. But that's okay. There are other currencies that have kind of um, tried to replace that idea. <laughs> Um, cool. So I did want to get into, in our last couple minutes here, um, some of the kind of other interesting applications for blockchain technology, um, as well as kind of some of its, well, I guess we have talked a little bit about, I very strongly lean towards the democratic aspect of it. I think that it's very cool. Um, so other applications for a blockchain styled technology. They mostly revolve around this idea that we push the incentive system um, onto the individual and it works such that they are then incentivized to act in the group self-interest. You basically align the individual and the group. Um, and you allow for this kind of perfect no, uh, no trickery. Um, so you can't invalidate any part of the system um, without people noticing. So I think that anytime you have in, uh, like an accounting style uh, problem, so very small minutia that need to be kind of tracked with perfect accuracy, um, and anytime that you have a trust problem, so I'm incentivized if I can break trust without you knowing, um, and then anytime that you have like money, basically. Um, so the money basically operating as like the best incentive system for almost <laughs> any person. <laughs> Humans are very simple. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I think that if you're looking at, let's say, a charity, um, and this charity receives a lot of money because their cause is quite good and just, and there are enough good people in the world that get a lot of money, um, this charity is then incentivized to mask how much money they receive. And it is technically true that there are laws um, that should prevent the charity from hiding that money or laundering it or um, basically just handing it off to individuals within the charity. Um, and technically, there are laws that prevent you from you know, murdering people. But those laws really just give the world grounds for how to punish you afterward. Um, and they give you, I guess in concept, guidelines on what not to do and what to do. But that doesn't really necessarily mean that a charity, for example, um, couldn't get away with this uh, for quite some time. And for enough time that it matters, right? Like, or such that it's irreversible. Um, however, let's say that we switch their ledger system um, to a blockchain-styled ledger system. So this would, I would imagine in concept, uh, you could do this at the individual company level, but I'm not entirely sure how much I would trust a system like that. But we could also do this at a level of um, kind of this broad democratic level where 
it is merely another cryptocurrency that you can earn money off of. Um, and it's implemented in that way to kind of help the incentive system. But from there, this charity's assets and transactions, all transactions occur within the charity. Um, so your blocks are, you would probably, you would need a way to kind of change the way that this is mined to make proof of work scaled correctly, um, such that people weren't just earning arbitrarily large amounts of currency off of this. However, this charity's transactions are now part of a blockchain that they then have made public. Now, charities in the United States, at least, I believe their transaction history is public. Um, that is actually a property of a charity. Um, however, that publicness is subject to being manipulated. That publicness is subject to a timing problem um, where they can withhold how much of that comes through until after. Um, and there are many other issues with how that works. But under the kind of conditions of a blockchain, the charity's transactions are now public in such a way that if they are changed in any way, um, anyone who's watching is available, is able to see those changes and validate it. Um, and so you basically are then able to say with, we'll say 100, or almost 100% confidence um, and realistic and logistically 100% confidence that this charity's transactions are legitimate or not legitimate. Um, you can, any one transaction you can actually validate. Well, now it is impossible for this charity to kind of manipulate facts, right? Um, that is the conceptualization. And actually, as put here by Screaming War, um, the real purpose of blockchain is to remove the involvement of a trusted third party. And yeah, that, well, I, okay, to say yes is, I guess, a weird answer. Um, but I believe that that is one of its greatest innovations, is that we don't have to trust a third party. In fact, you can operate on any level of security, um, finance being a pretty high one, um, where there is no third party. And IG Riley's question, in the charity example, you have to trust a third party, right? Uh, well, no, actually, there is no third party here. There is no one third party. There is no individual entity that can act um, in, well, I would say collaboration, but really on its own. Um, and so the kind of benefit to the charity example is that the third party at play is really every operator um, involved in the blockchain. And so that's where I would say that you actually would want to open that to um, a general kind of business blockchain, uh, where all businesses authenticate each other and them their own transactions um, in the same way that a transaction occurring on Bitcoin is authenticated by you and all of your peers, um, you're authenticating all of the transactions within that business via other businesses. Um, this can also be instantiated within a business, um, kind of under the assumption that at a micro level, humans still operate the same way. They still are operating in their own self-interest. Um, and the reason that that removes the third party is that your third party at any one point, the one that is authenticating a ledger or validating these transactions or adding to the blockchain, um, is distributed. There are many, many actors who are all competing to operate or authenticate um, the blockchain. And the reason that that is interesting and useful is that we agree that those actors will all act in their own self-interest, and they are all incentivized um, via, maybe in this case, a currency, or there is some, uh, currency actually I think works beautifully well because money is great. Um, and we'll, we'll clip that. <laughs> yeah, and that's just now the only sample <laughs> that everyone has gotten out of this. Um, but <laughs> it is uh, basically always, I think, so long as our economy functions the way it does, um, it will always work that money will be a great incentivizer um, for people to operate. And you can assume people will operate in their own self-interest. And because of that kind of combination of facts, um, you end up being able to say, hey, um, no one person is in control, and no collaboration amongst any subset of those people, except all of them, would effectively beat the system. To me, it almost seems like an analogy for classical economics. Yeah. Like Adam Smith era economics. I think it's very Adam Smith styled, where yeah. it's like humans are rational, they all will operate on their own, to their own benefit, and you can't induce collusion of enough of them. Um, yeah. Do you like get the. To work. Uh, like ridiculous accumulation of resources kind of skews it, just like it does in real yeah. life. Um, <laughs> but I, I can see the parallels. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think that that system is not at all fleshed out. Um, and the conceptualization that I just kind of enumerated is not 
possible at the moment. It hasn't been brought into existence. Um, and that is kind of my justification and reasoning for saying that this sort of fad, um, the fad part will go away um, by definition of fads. However, um, I think that the kind of applications for these things are very interesting and very uh, long-standing in that people are naturally, I think, very afraid of basing a system, um, especially dealing with like money, um, in a trust framework that hasn't existed before. Um, how do I trust something if it has a third party? The implication being that there must be a third party, um, but that's no longer true. And so you start to see these kind of problems arise um, or manifest in looking at how Congress interrogates uh, these CEOs of major tech companies. Um, where the kind of question they ask tends to miss the point. And that sounds very high and mighty, um, but I have, I think, sufficient evidence for what I'm arguing, which is um, in the questioning of Sundar Pichai from Google, um, congressmen were able to, or asked him um, about his product in particular. Um, they revealed a misunderstanding of the business model um, and how that works, how Google works, as well as how Facebook worked, actually, in the Zuckerberg uh, hearings. And I think that there's this very large gap um, between the previous iterations of technology and the previous kind of underlying themes, uh, those underlying themes being we must trust third parties, um, there is no incentive system that will align the group and the individual, and um, we need to always have um, like a government style entity or some entity that can validate things for us. Also, validation is always subject to imperfection. I think those assumptions are all around still um, and were much more prevalent and true before. Um, some of them are no longer true. Um, and I guess that relies on my own personal assumption that I will kind of always place an implicit trust in mathematically um, proving things, but you can prove that some things have no information about, their con about the thing that they originally came from. Uh, so that is in reference to a hash function. Um, and I think that that is where I start to place more trust in these systems, is if I know with 100% certainty uh, or with high probability such that it will never realistically occur, um, then I'm willing to trust a system like that. And I think that a lot of my predecessors and a lot of people above me um, would count that as naive and or foolish. Um, but I am not convinced by their evidence or lack thereof. Um, and I, I think that that is kind of where I think our generation, um, and I guess we'll just kind of include ourselves in this generation, are starting to see that they're there are kind of these implicit biases and lacks of trust in, let's say, a blockchain system um, that are not based on evidence or reason. Um, and that gets into a whole kind of philosophical debate and arguments about, well, where is evidence and reason? Who's justified in uh, judging or explaining things? And I think that's beyond the scope of my life, probably. <laughs> um, but it is kind of an interesting shift that I think we'll start to see is why, why place your trust um, in, in any third party if you don't have to? Why not build a system that does not require it? Um, particularly since I am, I think, afraid of AI and machine learning, um, not necessarily just because I don't understand it, but rather because we don't understand it as people. Um, and I think that that should scare people. And so if you can move away from a system where we trust an arbitrary third party, that can prevent us from ever trusting um, the AI <laughs> third parties. So I, I think that in general, um, that is roughly where we've gotten to on our um, cryptocurrency talk. There is quite a bit um, that has been left untouched. There are many cryptocurrencies. If we didn't touch on your favorite one, sorry. Millions. They, they, there are so many. Um, and they're all over the place. They all have varying pros and cons. Um, we didn't touch at all in how you might go about investing in them or using them to make money. Um, I don't know how qualified I would be to use them to make money. <laughs> um, there, we, there are many things, I guess, that we could have touched on. Um, there's a lot of math behind this that you can go into that's very interesting. Um, there's a lot of software that you can talk about that has varying pros and cons and has implemented um, 
part of or all of or none of um, what we've just discussed. There are, there are many, many nuanced parts <laughs> to all of what we've just talked about. And I would say that that barely touches on any of the surface. Um, and, uh, surface on it. Blackbeard's even uh, fishing. He's saying, "Can you send me Bitcoin so I can see the process?" <laughs> East London came back with a, I think, equally valid fishing, uh, which says, "Yes, sure. What's your VSEG number?" <laughs> that one, a little less, a uh, little less subtle on that one. Yeah, that one's probably a little bit, a uh, little older. <laughs> and we're still keeping up with the uh, gongle currency, kringle bucks, and dunkle money. Oh man, yeah, there's a. That bunch joke of stuff has out there. lasted the whole. That's going to be a joke oh, that we're going to hear for the, the rest of. <laughs> Humanities existence. Excuse me. It was good though. I enjoyed. It. I cracked up multiple times <laughs> reading yeah. the chat today. Um, people seem to uh, enjoy it though. Thanks for the talk. Interesting yeah, stuff. It's turned into a fascinating <laughs> monologue. Um, Adam was saying that you misspelled your password so he could see. I did through. misspell my password, uh, which is you know, as a paranoid person, it does freak me out. You guys know how long my password is. Like you could at any time pause that and then see. Um, <laughs> And that, that bothers me a little bit. Um, luckily, it's long enough that it would take quite some time to brute force it. And I don't, well, you know, I'm, I've learned that you shouldn't challenge the power of the internet. Um, yeah, the internet's pretty, pretty freaky. Because shortly I'll see my password displayed in this, and I'll be like, <laughs> oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Are you 22, asks East London? Uh, no. No, I'm, uh, hmm. Well, I'm 20, actually, at the time of this talk. Are you almost 21? Is that where you said? Yeah, we're, yeah, I was like, oh, we're getting there. Uh, we are close. Almost to 21. We're, we're getting there in a bit. <laughs> It'll yeah, be a little there. while. Uh, Gongo is a Fortune 500 hyper company. <laughs> there's, there's so many parts to this joke. The, um, yeah, the table's, today's stream was very entertaining. The chat was very fun to look at. Uh, thank you for coming on. You know, as yeah, is tradition, you. we have to go to your, uh, to your what is it? Um, Oh, the uh, screensaver. Yeah. Or the piping into lolcat. I forgot what it is. Yeah, C matrix. C matrix. That's the one. We have to. We have to close on that. <laughs> um, yeah. Next week, have you on again? Yeah. Yeah. And then maybe uh, do a. Not sure. We have a bunch of topics. Cali was one of them. Yeah. A CTF live. <laughs> I think CTF. we'll be doing a live CTF at some point. Yeah, um, that'll be fun. That'll be pretty entertaining. We have millions of ideas. Trillions yeah, of ideas. So many ideas. Actually, uh, um, which I think will all be pretty entertaining. <laughs> Thanks so much to everybody who tuned in today. Um, uh, this week we're going to have Chad Sharp for the first time. Oh, um, sweet. It's not 100% established what the talk's going to be on, but 95% sure it's going to be an intro to functional programming. Oh, wow. Um, probably With uh, O'Camel? Okay. Probably in Haskell. Ah, actually. that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, only here at, uh, at Harvard do we use O'Camel. Okay. Yeah, and Jane Street. Yeah, I know. I'm actually not familiar with that. Yeah, it's a, it's a time. Um, I actually, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of functional programming. I'm not. Not sure how much I like OCaml. Uh, OCaml is very beautiful after you get used to it. Um, oh, yeah. So in retrospect, I really liked that class, but during, not so much. <laughs> if everybody's hyped for the functional, let me know, um, because we're debating between either functional or like a crypto stream, because Chad's sort of um, yeah. final project is crypto related. And I know Bavik's actually found both of them, so this is going to be a real <laughs> sort of Always like a difficult, heart uh, splitter for him. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, East London, the schedule below the stream probably is mostly empty because we don't a week we don't have any other streams except for the one coming up this week. And I was just chatting with Chad earlier today, um, <laughs> trying to get everything completely fixed up. JP guys spoken and say, "Hey, it looks like I only caught the end of the stream." Oh, unfortunate timing, JP. Unfortunate timing. <laughs> Not Haskell, anything but Haskell says Andre. I'm actually very curious to learn Haskell because I don't know Haskell yeah. very well. I've seen it a little it. bit. Um, I know it's kind of eloquent in the same way that OCaml is. Uh, yeah. I think most functional languages actually are kind of eloquent after, uh, like I after like, you get used to them. <laughs> I like how Haskell sort of writes out just like math. It's like very yeah, declarative. It's very math It's very declarative way of like writing out programs. It's kind of um, like that, or like the um, the lambda calculus way of writing things. Oh yeah, man, like it's very that is that's brutal. Very math. <laughs> I don't know if I want to. Very math heavy. I'm, just, I'm in the process of learning lambda calculus and how it works. <laughs> we could do a stream on that maybe at some point. Yeah. Um, Bitcoin can be hype, but the underlying technology can revolutionize the way we see trust. He says screaming yeah. more. I, I would generally agree with that. Yeah. I, I think that's one of my favorite parts of it, is the, uh, the way we look at trusting people. Or things, machines at some point. <laughs> Functional or crypto, mathematical or not exclusive or. I like that. Well, maybe we'll Very do both cool. at some point. Chad's only here for a week, though, so it can only be one stream. So it'll probably, oh, be, probably be functional. <laughs> if I'm guessing. Functional seems to be what most people are excited about. Bella Kira saying, fascinating stream. Thanks, Nick. Timestone, hi, I'm new here. Hello, Timestone. Oh, thank you, <laughs> Larry Lowell and Timestone for the follows. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed Nick's awesome talk on Bitcoin. Oh, no, I won't say Bitcoin, that's generalization. Yeah, on, there's um, uh, lots of Cryptocurrency. Things. Crypto. 
<laughs> you even had a nice little section on hashing. I enjoyed yeah, that. Yeah, that was very cool. Right? Your beautiful hash <laughs> got function. To, got to build some silly your hash functions. impenetrable hash function. <laughs> That'll come back and haunt me. Someone will say, ah, this was your favorite hash function. I'll be like, that's not what I said. But that's, that, is your thesis. Thesis. that is your thesis and a function right there. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> thesis is so terrifying <laughs> at the moment. Uh, uh, it's coming up, isn't it? It is coming up. The next year, I have to, I have to write a thesis. You know I have to find you... some thesis advisors right now. Oh, you don't know what you're going to do. Do you have any ideas where you want to go? Um, domain -wise? I was thinking a little bit about operating systems um, okay. and modeling them after living systems. So actually, most of my focus and talk is um, is on uh, biological inspirations for computerized systems and computation. Um, so like evolutionary algorithms, I think, are super cool. Oh, but, uh, actually, <laughs> Doug is going to do a genetic algorithm oh, on that's uh, awesome. next uh, two weeks from now, I think. Sweet. Either next week or two weeks from now. I'll probably tune into that. <laughs> yeah, that'll be fun. You did one for the law course that they taught. Yeah. Genetics. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Huh. Yeah. Super cool concept. Um, or like random forests, for example. I kind of like that. Yeah, I'm not super familiar. I think Doug might have even mentioned that, actually, when he that was talk, telling me about the... Uh, <laughs> so that's coming up. So Doug's going to be doing a, a genetic algorithm stream, not this week, but next week or the week after. The stream, the schedule will be updated. Our Harvard, uh, the, uh, Harvard thesis... <laughs> I misread that. <laughs> Our Harvard thesis open source. Um, they do get published somewhere. Um, Harvard's not the best at, like, publishing things. I was told by an older friend that... Um, your thesis will be read by approximately four people, which is like you, your parents, and and you again when you edit it. Nice. <laughs> so sounds meaningful. So yeah, um, it's it's kind of, and I mean like any professor that do it that, that does thesis advising will probably tell you that it, no, it's very meaningful and very important. Um, but I don't, I don't know. Uh, I think they are published. Don't quote me on that. Um, well, or do people on the internet will do what they want? Um, <laughs> too late. It's too late. Yeah, I've already been quoted. My people are you're already quoted. It's on Wikipedia that. at this uh, point. <laughs> It's and also, sad Wikipedia. Time Stone saying that's their birthday, so shout out to <laughs> oh, Time Stone. Happy birthday, happy birthday <laughs> Time Stone. Thanks for joining us on your birthday, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, Adam Antine by Partite uh, says, I like how they're open to suggestion for the streams, then they just do whatever, like biological <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, I think we like talking, um, which, is, which is what uh, we like doing on this. Um, we also, I think, want to demonstrate a little bit that these sorts of topics can be open to um, to the general public, and you know we're not we're not crazy geniuses or anything. We just like to get up here, and we happen to have a uh, medium to do it. Yeah. But um, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we can't get every suggestion. That might be a part yeah. of what he's saying is that we they some of the suggestions might go unrecognized or unheard. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's. Um, what I'm... But you know, it's hard. Not we don't have uh, folks that are experts at necessarily every subset of CS, which there that are trillions. There are so many subsets. Um, and so yeah, it can be hard yeah, to reconcile crazy. that with you know the expertise we have on file versus what people want. Yeah. But we're we try. Um, <laughs> next stream we'll be creating the MVP for Gongle, right? Sounds about right. Sounds, yeah, 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 yeah that's, I would that's, say that's so. Good. Tomorrow, <laughs> tune in tomorrow. We'll be presenting to VC shortly. So. <laughs> Gongle all day. We could. I'm pretty with reasonable confidence. I think we could get VC funding for that, um, <laughs> which is kind of absurd. But, um, <laughs> VC funding right now is kind of just like, hey, you want money? Sure. <laughs> and you for have Gongle. A, yeah. Let's do it. I think we could do it. Let's do it. I pretty reasonably. <laughs> it's our uh, blockchain distributed company. Um, yeah. We use Twitch as a medium. That's that's how all interactions actually have to happen. Is oh, it all? It's like perfectly public. It's the We'll say the idealistic incarnation of a public company. Wow. Yeah, that is that is kind of fascinating. Yeah, every single every single transaction, every single negotiation. <laughs> Happens in full public, validated by you guys. <laughs> wow. That would be pretty interesting. It'd be kind That'd of be, wild. I'd actually be super down to see that. <laughs> yeah, this lawsuit's about to happen in public. Anytime by a it's going to sue true. for the IP. It will be like, well, uh -oh. it's, all, it's all online. That's how it is, man. <laughs> lawsuit would be very quick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Well, yeah. um, it is 5.08, so thanks yeah. again to everybody who tuned in. This was CSV Time Twitch, yes. Cryptocurrency yeah. with Nick Wong. So thanks, yep. Nick. Yeah, thank you, guys. <laughs> um, more details to come very shortly on the functional talk that we're going to have with Chad. 95% uh, functional, possibly 5% um, <laughs> crypto something related. Like 3% Cryptography, Chad, you know? yeah. <laughs> Which should actually tie in fairly well with the stream that we did today, but... Um, yeah. You know. Hopefully at a more technical level. Like I'm always so, unsure. Where we're uh, going yeah, it, yeah. I think I think <laughs> we I think we were approachable enough. And we did a little a little bit a little of the technical stuff. We could always go more. We could always go less. It's it's a hard. Yeah, it's true. a tough balance. Again. Maybe we'll hop into a, a technical chat one of yeah. these days. Crypto in Haskell. Hey, there's an, there's oh. the ultimate sort of reconciliation, right? That's actually probably pretty easy. You know? Yeah, it probably is. That actually, probably yeah, a lot of this stuff's all based in math. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So yeah. Mathematician's language. Thanks for the <laughs> suggestion, Andre. I'll actually yeah. ask Chad how he feels about that. <laughs> Did I ruin the stream? No, Adam. No, no, you're good. Was, I think you added to it. The actually. jokes were the jokes were memorable. We will yeah. remember those forever. <laughs> Gongle for life. Um, and uh, yeah, everybody That's with hilarious. their awesome comments. Thanks everybody yeah, so thank much. You Catch you all very soon. The stream will get updated. This was CS50 on Twitch. We will see you later this week. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>